Hi, everyone. Today, we're going to talk about historical anachronisms. Did you know that 100% of all Roman emperors and kings of England have all been transgender? Well, not really, I'm tricking you here so that you'll watch the video. But did you know that one of them may have been? Emperor of Rome, I mean. Being trans. It's been a while since I made a transgender video, so here goes. <laughs> If you spend any significant time on the internet, you've probably seen a variation of this meme. Basically saying that historians generally have a tendency of erasing gay people from history. And partially that is true. As a historian, it's all I love to do. I love to destroy my own history. And in a related way, you may also have heard a traditional argument against trans people generally, saying that the concept of trans is a modern invention. And these two arguments obviously do not interact very much. One of the arguments says that LGBT people exist in history, but are often overshadowed by um, mainstream historians. The other argument says that trans people haven't existed, but that we in the modern day have a tendency of imprinting transness onto the past where it didn't really exist. Because as we know, transgenderism was invented, <laughs> transgenderism was invented in 2017 by Caitlyn Jenner in very controlled laboratory conditions and hasn't been around before then. Which places me in the wonderful position of being somewhere in between as a transgender historian. Which is why this video is about a Roman emperor slash empress and a Swedish queen. I'm finally giving you what you want, Swedish history. No Swedes are gonna watch this video, because despite being Swedish, uh, you only make up 4% of my viewing <laughs> potential. I hope you Americans are gonna like this story about Queen Christina. But before we dig into the actual good stuff, and just so I can alienate even more of my own viewership, I want to talk quickly about what it means for something to be anachronistic. Anachronistic means to place something into a time frame where it doesn't belong. This could be something obvious, such as monster trucks in the 15th century, and it could also be something as applying a modern idea into a past that didn't have that idea. Say, for example, capitalism in the Neolithic era. And it's a very common mistake that a lot of people do. It's one of the main things that when you study to be an historian, they train you to avoid doing. And that is taking an historical example and judging it or analyzing it using modern norms. Now, this might seem obvious. We can't judge the past by modern standards. I mean, there are a few things we can, like slavery was always bad, for example. But, but sometimes it can be a bit more difficult. Take, for example, the idea of two men kissing and rolling around in the grass. Today, it would be very much seen as a that stuff's gay, but that would not be the case in all of human history. Male interactions have differed throughout history, and there have been points in time when it has been fully acceptable for heterosexual men to roll around and kissing in the grass. Even though today, we would say that that's not fully heterosexual behavior. An unfortunate side effect of this, though, is that because this adds a layer of vagueness and complexity to much of historical writing, historians tend to end on the side of the norm. Historians have a tendency of being white, male, European, straight people who have a tendency of not considering possibilities outside of that norm. And sometimes this is accurate. In most historical academia, erring on the side of the norm is oftentimes going to get you sometime in the ballpark of a right answer, but it's not going to get you the right answer all the time. The norm is only the norm most of the time, not all of the time. This is where we have people who, well, erase the gays. There are, however, historians who judge on the side of abnormal, or rather, things that don't fit in the historical cultural norm of the past. Not necessarily because they think that it's the most correct answer. Oftentimes history isn't as clear cut as that. But rather to examine the idea that maybe these two men rolling around in the grass are just really good friends. But what if they're not? 
What if they are lovers? What if they make love in that grass? What if they're having a really raunchy time in that grass? What if they're committing profane sins in that grass? That's an interesting question. Is it the right answer? Maybe. That's not really interesting. The real interesting question is, what if? But you can only really ask these questions when there already is some vagueness. You can't just say like, what if George Washington was a transgender man? Because he wasn't. Like, he just straight up wasn't. There is no ambiguity there that you could explore. It's just, it's just, it's nothing. There has been a tendency though, in many subcultures, especially on the internet, of wanting to attribute their own subcultural identity on two historical figures. And this brings me to the very interesting historical character of Elagab El Elagabus. I don't speak Latin. Possible trans woman and definite party person. Elagabalus was a teenage emperor of the Roman Empire between the year 218 and 222. Her reign is most remembered historically for being one of the worst emperors, numerous sex scandals and religious controversy. I'm going to use she her pronouns during this segment because of simplicity and because pronoun discourse just wasn't a thing in the second century as far as we know. And to make a quick introduction, she was not popular. She restructured the Roman imperial religious order by placing the god that she was priest of, Elagabal, at the top of the Roman pantheon, which a lot of people did not like. She despised the Senate, famously a smart thing to do in Rome, and spent more time partying in orgies than respecting political tradition. Queen shit. She was also married five times, twice to the same woman, along with some informal marriages, which is how we start our story of her maybe being a trans woman. There are three main sources that discuss the reign of Elagabalus, and one of them, Cassius Dio, refers to her with feminine pronouns, and talks about her marriage with a man called Hierocles, a chariot driver who she would call her husband, to whom she was wife. Cassius Dio also mentions how she would wear wigs and makeup, style herself in a feminine manner, refer to herself as a lady and not a lord. There's also a famous anecdote that she offered half the empire to any surgeon who would give her what we today call bottom surgery. We've all been there. And she would apparently prostitute herself in taverns and brothels. This girl knows how to party. Normally this would be dismissed as slander by political opponents or historical enemies, which happens. Catherine the Great, for example, did not actually have sex with a horse, but it's such a specific thing to slander about that it might actually be true, especially considering the many scandals that affected her reign, although probably with some exaggeration, especially from Cassius Dio. But there is a bit of a gray area, and that's important, because for much of history, historians weren't super concerned with accuracy and would often make stuff up in order to tell better stories, which would make them more famous, which would sell them more parchment. Never stop the grind, Cassius. All three sources for the idea that Elagabalus is trans, though, Herodian, Cassius Dio, who we already mentioned, and the life of Elagabalus from the Historia Augustia, start out from the position of outright hostility against Elagabalus. And of course, it's important to mention that femininity was seen as a bad thing. It shouldn't be, but it was. And it was very common to insult men by calling them women. But of course, that doesn't mean that they're trans. That said though, let's examine some more evidence. Because it's not just Dia who writes about Elagabalus's clothing style and feminine appearance, but also the historian Herodian, who is seen as being a bit more objective in his writings about Elagabalus. And the writings of these sources overlap significantly while being written independently, which gives them a significant amount of substance. And also, the writing of Herodian was a bit less sensational than that of Dio, but also didn't contradict anything that Dio was writing. They were annoyed when they saw the emperor, his face painted more elaborately than that of any modest woman, dancing in luxurious robes and effeminately adorned with the gold necklaces. So, was Elagabalus then trans? 
based on these surviving stories. Well, for the first part, gender non-conforming behavior doesn't necessarily mean that someone is trans. As we know, the cultural phenomenon of transness, not just the identity, is something that is more recently recognized and can't really be ascribed to something that happened roughly 2000 years ago. But these are multiple independent sources that all basically say that this is a person who identified or wanted to identify as a woman. And that's basically what a trans woman is. In the case of Elagabalus, it's really down to a question of judgment and guessing. Judging in either way here is kind of wrong, and the only real answer is that it is complicated. Saying that Elagabalus wasn't trans is just as wrong as saying that she was. Either answer here is correct. The gray area is what's interesting, as of course it is for many people in history. But you're not going to be wrong for calling her trans as long as the context of it being a widely different social context than any sort of transness or gender nonconformity today. Although and apparently in Crusader Kings 3, they just made her a woman, which I, I, I gotta respect that. And this is a nice story. It's a good example of reevaluating historical characters from a more gender critical, oh shit, hold on, from a more inclusive point of view. My problem though, comes when people take this point of view and apply it wrongly. Now, isn't that just wonderful? A nice story about a nice what-if scenario that has a bit of historical academic like girth to it. There's real plausibility there, and that's pretty cool, for lack of a better term. Not necessarily like an icon or someone to look up to, this is a person who lived like 2000 years ago, but we're not gonna dig into that. It's just neat and for the purposes of identifying an historical character as a trans woman, that's really all that is. It's neat. There are tendencies, though, of taking this what-if scenario and taking it too far. Many subcultures, especially LGBT subcultures, have a tendency of wanting to find historical legitimacy. And I get why, right? A common argument against LGBT people is that this is a modern invention that doesn't actually have any roots in human nature. It's just modern decadence. And so to find historical individuals who fit the bill is a good way to just undercut that argument. But I've also noticed that this is something that can give you as an individual personal validity. If you feel that your identity is often under attack and you yourself are not strong enough to uphold that identity on your own, which fair, if you don't have a community that can be pretty hard to do, it's easy to look to history. I'm guilty of this myself. I talk about Magnus Schiedsfeld every single time I can, but as I mentioned, this is also a story about a queen as well. A story where this has gone a bit too much, a bit of an overcorrection. It's nothing too bad about it, but I feel like it's worth exploring, mostly because it pisses me off. And that is the story about Queen Christina of Sweden. Hi folks. We're doing more outdoorsy things because we need to break up the format a little bit. And today I'm taking you to Uppsala Castle. Almost slipped and fucking died there. It's also just big high up on a, on a big hill so it's windy as hell. Although, looks nice. So the history of Queen Christina is actually quite interesting. She came into power after the death of her father, uh, the lead singer of Sabaton, Gustavus Adolphus, uh, who died at the Battle of Lützen. And she took to ruling quite willingly. Um, obviously, Gustavus Adolphus had wanted for a male heir to the throne of the Empire of Sweden, uh, but sometimes you don't get what you want. Uh, but Queen Christina was very eager to rule nonetheless. She took a great interest in direct rule, often circumventing uh, the Rikskansler, uh, Uxelskjana, and also taking a great interest in the arts, philosophy, uh, and religion. While Elagabalus was a ruler who liked to party, Christina was a ruler who liked to rule. Her interest in these things led her to invite some of the finest academics around Europe to Sweden, including, of course, uh, René Descartes, who got sick up here and fucking died. Uh, nerd. Apparently, because it's too cold here in Sweden. 
and I mean, I, I get it. I'm fre freezing my ass off here. She also wrote quite interestingly about the role of women, and especially the role of noble women, as she was in a very interesting position of being both a woman and being the ruler of Sweden, like as a sovereign. Now, being sovereign is usually a title reserved to king, and sometimes in history, when queens are in charge of a country, oftentimes they will co-rule with some of the local nobility. The idea being that women can't really rule. But Christina didn't give a shit. She wanted to rule. She also dressed a little unconventionally for women of the time, and she also had a tendency of bad-mouthing other noble women. And some of these writings that she would do would also give the impression of not being like the other girls, having masculine interests and so on. And just like with Elagabalus, this led to some speculation both about her behavior and her actual sex. Even at the time of her death, there was some speculation that she wasn't entirely a woman. Her behavior couldn't be explained away by uh, just having a personality. <laughs> there were some speculated that she was, in fact, uh, half man, something that we would today perhaps call intersex. However, some studies of her grave after her death has shown that that probably was not the case, which has led some other people to speculate that maybe her gender identity wasn't woman at all. However, this is not backed up by anyone from an historical point of view. The historical consensus is that Queen Christina just was a woman, was a bit different. The way her reign ended, though, is quite interesting, and it comes from her interest in religion. Sweden at this time was fighting the Thirty Years' War, uh, which had some religious undertones, uh, and Sweden at this time was a Protestant nation, uh, very militantly so. But Christina, however, wanted to convert to Catholicism. That doesn't jive, you can't do that. Uh, so the way she resolved that was she abdicated the throne. Uh, right, right there. In that room. And then she most likely went out into the courtyard uh, and fucking left to go to Rome. <laughs> but none of this actually speaks of someone who is necessarily transgender or of gender dysphoria. That is a more modern invention. And that is an idea that comes from wanting to promote a theater performance. Once again, theater kids are to blame for everything wrong with academic history. So as I mentioned, there's some speculation during her life and afterwards about her like gender non-conforming behavior. And that's fine. There is some gray area there that's like wonderful to explore, uh, especially when talking about like a women's role in uh, in society at the time, the role between the nobility and being a woman. But around 2015 and 2016, Sweden is having a little bit of a transgender moment. People are talking more about trans rights. The government has recently like apologized for forcibly sterilized people, which is kind of nice. And there's one person who's pretty prominent in Swedish discourse, and that is an actress called Alexa Lundberg. Now, Alexa Lundberg is an actress uh, who does some acting. She's one of the first trans people to have been part of like the Swedish uh, arts academies. Uh, she's been part of... She's been a, a, like a pioneer a little bit in like Swedish art. And in 2016, she has a performance called King Christina. Now she wants to take these ideas, these gray areas of gender expression, uh, and apply them to an historical character who's famous for it, as in Queen Christina. So she releases an article that hints to the idea that Queen Christina was, in fact, a transgender man. And it uses some of the anecdotes that I mentioned before. The gender non-conforming behavior and the not like other girls. And this play becomes kind of influential. There's not a lot of like transgender art going on at the moment, and this is pretty unique for that. But as part of the marketing for this, the idea that Christina is a trans man is not posited in a sort of hypothetical what-if scenario, but rather as an historical fact that has been hidden away by mainstream historians. Except that's not at all the situation here, and we have some pretty good indications for this. For example, Christina never talks about identifying as a man, rather she wants to embody what men can do in society, which for a woman in those times is kind of understandable. Uh, women didn't have many rights, even noble women. And as queen, she's not as respected as sovereign as a king would be. And we also know that after she went to Rome, after her abdication, she was a great sponsor of the arts and philosophy, uh, but she never lived as a trans man. She never identified as a man, she never referred to herself as a man. 
Uh, so we, if she what, if she identified as a man, she did a pretty bad job at like expressing that. So there's no evidence for this actually being a thing, except now the damage is done. A few years ago, I was walking around here because this is the town where I got my history degree. I got right over there. Actually, and I was taking a history tour, an LGBT history tour around the town. And there's some pretty cool, interesting things, like the, the Institute for Race Biology is a bit over there. That's where they decided to sterilize people. And there are also some uh, university dormitories that some early gay activism happened in. It's all good stuff. But when they got to the castle, the guide started to mention that it's just recently come to light that Queen Christina, who abdicated her throne here, was a transgender man. And at the time, I figured, hold on, that doesn't seem right. But I don't know enough about it to actually go say anything against it. Now, this false fact has been repeated over and over and over again in many various types of like Swedish trans subcultural history events, which sounds very niche. And it is niche, but the problem then is that because it is niche, it doesn't get countered as much as it should be. And now we end up in a situation where Quite frequently, when Queen Christina is mentioned in Swedish discourse, often in terms of gender, because again, she did have some gender non-conforming expressions, uh, she may even have had some, some lesbian relationships going on, quite probably actually, um, whenever those are mentioned, actual he real historical, like, interesting theories, they're always overshadowed by trans people who, in good faith, but wrongly, claim that she is in fact transgender. And that's not great. Woo! That sure is something. Well, the problem here is that it's not really that huge of a problem. When speculating about Roman emperors, it's interesting. You can discover these gray areas, and I think we should re-examine many historical characters out of the perspective that what if they are gay or trans or anything else? Most of the time, it's not gonna hurt. The problem is though that when you overcorrect too much, there is a tendency to attribute people to be something that they're not with no evidence of supporting it. And if those perceptions seep into the public consciousness as with Queen Christina, there's a tendency that real historical narratives will be disrupted. And there's nothing really wrong with that either. I can't believe I'm saying that as an historian. True history doesn't really matter, don't worry about it. But it does become a problem because it allows the real history to be used as ammunition against the subculture that labeled the false history. If we say that Queen Christina is a trans man, anyone can look up a book and say that, no, you're wrong. Unfortunately, we still have to stick within the realm of plausibility. And we should. Obviously no one's preventing you of drawing fan art of a historical monarch who killed thousands of people, but if you want to do that, no one's stopping you. Just don't pass it off as academic fact, because it's not. There's also the problem of misremembering the actual Queen Christina, her actual legacy, which is kind of interesting. Her big thing was that she renounced Protestantism, converted to Catholicism, and went to Rome abdicated the throne of Sweden. That's a pretty big deal. And there are many other parts of her story that I haven't mentioned here that are fairly interesting. Many of them have to do with gender expression and sexuality, but those nuances disappear. Just as the nuance disappeared when most historians has a tendency of labeling people as being straight cis people. It causes oversimplification of interesting people. And this is also something that occasionally comes up when people want to be transphobic. I've seen a lot of transphobic feminists in Sweden claim that the transes are trying to steal Queen Christina from us. I mean, if you want to have a monarch as feminist icon, sure. Eh. But that is something that we could avoid if we embrace the nuance, the gray area. Her gray area comes out when talking about the role of women in nobility the perception of masculinity as a monarch while being a woman. Those conflicts are really interesting, but those don't exist when they are all overshadowed by the implication that they mean that she's trans, rather than a noble woman stuck in a weird space between femininity and monarchy. 
Now, I hope that you've enjoyed all of this, even though it's very uh, Swedish-centric. I guess also Italy-centric. Does Rome count as Italian? <laughs> and I realize that this maybe isn't the most algorithm-friendly episode. It's a bit of a shorter one because it is Christmas, Christmas is coming up, uh, and I'm going to take a little bit of time off because uh, I, I do that. But that brings me to talking about Nebula. A bunch of creators and me has gone together to make Nebula, which is an online streaming platform where a bunch of educational YouTubers can post their content without being worried about the algorithm. Nebula has a ton of creators that you love if you like my content and has stuff that isn't on YouTube. I'm on there, I've done some episodes of some shows, there's gonna be more stuff in the future, god willing. It's all good fun. And Nebula has gone together with Curiosity Stream. Curiosity Stream is that place with tons and tons of documentaries that you'll love if you're into educational content. There's stuff on history, there's stuff on science, there's all sorts of things. And because this has been a very women-centric episode, yay women, <laughs> I want to recommend the documentary Women Who Changed History. It's a documentary that tells interesting historical stories about very influential women that I think is very topical for this. It's a documentary that I watched actually in preparation for this video because I was hoping that Queen Christina or Ella Gabalus would be mentioned in it. They're not, but it's still a good documentary uh, and I still recommend it. It's still fun. Uh, it's, it's, it's a good time. If you use the link in my description, you get a package deal where you get a discount of 26%, meaning you can get it for less than $15 a year. Plus, you get to have Nebula for as long as you have Curiosity Stream. And with all of that said, I hope that you as a viewer will watch history with more questions. And that's both if you think that the gays haven't existed before 1925, or if you're the kind of person who keeps labeling historical characters maybe a smidge too much because having questions is good and so at the end of this video i am abdicating the throne of my youtube channel to celebrate christmas and i'll be back next month thank you thank you for watching that video as I said, I wanted to make a video for December, but like I just made a video about uh, drinks. So I had like a week <laughs> to make this video, but I still hope you liked it. And the reason for that is, as I said, I'm gonna take some time off for the holidays that are coming up. I wanna thank all of my patrons and all of you for watching for, again, helping me make this YouTube channel into a career. At the start of the year, I had like 30,000 subscribers. Now I'm approaching quite quickly 100,000, which, is wild to me. Thank you so, so much. I do want to do a quick shout out for my Patreon. You could sign up to my Patreon if you want to, if you want to support my stuff financially, if you like it. You get stuff like extra streams, you get a thank you in the credits, um, and there are the potentials for more. It's all, it's all good fun. And I want to give a special thank you uh, at the end of this year to Aislinn, Alicia Crawford, Amanda B, Amara, Amelia Unchained, Amy Lee, Andy Sophia Fontaine, Angelo Garcia, Ashley K, Aster Disaster, Athiet, Austin K, Autumn, Batgirl Allison, Catherine Stenson, Chloe Dollar, Chris Overbeck, Christine Gutierrez, Corbusvere, Cooper Morrison, Dana Ferguson, D. Moran D. Araceto, Ella, Emil Lutuskowski, Emilia Clark, Erich Owens, Fox Kant, Gertrilla, Hannah Richards, Henry R. Seymour, Jane Lusby, Janelle Torgeson, Yareth Arnold, Jay Parker, Jane the Human, Jill Isabel Meyer, Stephanie Sterling, JKL, Jurgen, Joshua Analik, Julia Helene, LPQ Silver, Linus Topignol, Luna Noir, Madison Jacob, Marcus Smith, Mary Neckar, Maurizio, Mia, Michaela, Mo Khalifa, Nicholas Kapoor, Njofbun, OPB, Pat, Remy, Ricochet's Electrology, Rose Brunton, Rose H, Riley Knox, Samantha Tendra Rowan, Wife of Heather, Goddess of Thunder, Sean, No More Lolas, Sitzries, Sevilla Razan, Sonic Bread, Thea Vega, Thoris of Mir, Tulips, William for Hustle, Wawa -wa -wa Goose, Violet Tosukas Harrison, Vivian Crow, Wolfgang the Grand High Exalted Wizard, and Zachary Foreman. Thank you.